Hey guys, it's Amanda, and today I am going to be discussing the evolution of the word woke. Nowadays, the word woke can send a cringeworthy shiver down the spines of many people, whether you're an ardent liberal who once identified with the well-intentioned word, or someone on the right of the political spectrum who spits woke with the same venom reserved for words like political correctness, um, cancel culture, and snowflakes. In what has barely been a decade, the meaning and connotation that comes with woke has shifted a lot, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But first, I need to put on my glasses so people think I'm smarter than I actually am. And these ones just so happen to be provided by the sponsor of today's video, Warby Parker. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores offering eyeglasses, sunglasses, eye exams, and contact lenses. Their glasses start at just $95, including prescription lenses. You just need to take a quick quiz online and Warby Parker will suggest some glasses that fit your face and style. So you can order five pairs of glasses and try them on for five days. There's no obligation to buy and it includes a prepaid return shipping label. And here are some of the glasses that I'm trying on now, so definitely comment which ones you like the best. So I have these clear gray ones right here. I also got these sunglasses, this tortoiseshell moment. Ooh, oh my God, these ones are giving me like dark academia. I like these. And then these fun sunglasses. So again, don't forget to try Warby Parker's free home try-on program. You can order five pairs of glasses to try on at home for free for five days and there's no obligation to buy. They ship it free and it includes a prepaid return shipping label. So try five pairs of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash amanda767. Okay, now back to the evolution of woke. To be quite honest, I don't really talk about politics on my channel because one, it's not something I really feel well versed in. Um, I'm not really well versed in anything though. I'm just a person who talks and sometimes people listen, so that's cool. Um, and two, it can be a breeding ground for exceptionally unproductive and hateful internet discourse. So this is just me saying, please keep your unrelated political opinions to some other dark corner of the internet, especially if you have not watched the whole video. You know, I'm not trying to ignite a culture war in my comment section. With that said, let's get into a brief history of the word woke. In her Vox article, A History of Wokeness, Aja Romano writes, the first time many people heard woke in its current context was likely during the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri. Black citizens took to the streets nightly to protest the police shooting death of Michael Brown. As they did so, they urged each other to stay woke against police actions and other threats. The earliest known example of wokeness as a concept revolve around the idea of black consciousness waking up to a new reality or activist framework and dates back to the early 20th century. In 1923, a collection of aphorisms and ideas by the Jamaican philosopher and social activist Marcus Garvey included the summons, wake up Ethiopia, wake up Africa, as a call to global black citizens to become more socially and politically conscious. Since then, woke has largely circulated amongst black Americans and stay woke has since been used as a refrain in songs like R&B artist Erica Badu's 2008 rendition of Master Teacher on her politically themed album, New America. By 2014, with the Ferguson riots, Stay Woke increasingly took on the meaning of heightened awareness and alertness and began to carry an overtly political context. And now it's time to get woke with Tamika, with your host, Tamika. But by 2018, the cultural reception of woke had turned chilly. An NPR commentator begged leftists to retire the term, and the connotation of woke as a phony show of progressive activism had taken hold on the right. So in its short history, woke has gone through a few key phases. Pre-2014, when it was a term mostly within the black community, 2014 to 2018, when it became mainstream and politicized, Around 2017-2018, when the word started receiving backlash for being label-driven and superficial. I'm woke. Woke, woke. I'm woke. So, why aren't my jeans? Now they are. In 2018 to present day, 
when the word has become so appropriated and misused that the only thing left to do is satirize or completely reject it no matter what end of the political spectrum you fall on. Basically, for the time being, we've wrung this word dry and its main use now is as a punchline. So yeah, that's the video. That is the evolution of woke. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Just kidding, I need to unnecessarily prolong this video because watch time and the YouTube algorithm. Yay. What I actually want to do is talk about woke less as a linguist and more as an anthropologist who has literally never studied anthropology. Basically, I want to talk about my thoughts on and my relationship with wokeness over the past few years. So let's start back when I became woke. I definitely became woke in 2014, um, you know, around the time of Michael Brown and the Ferguson riots. Um, I just like remember seeing that on the news and like actually being able to process that like I remember exactly where I was Sitting in the family room CNN was on and it just like really Like it felt like I gained a new consciousness <laughs> Like genuinely and after that I just like really couldn't like stop thinking about the way like race and power um, just like played out in the world like it was not something that I could ignore anymore after that I got a lot more into learning about like race and America's very racist past like through media like watching documentaries such as the 13th I really began to see everything kind of through this woke lens or as you know W.E.B. Du Bois put it like kind of gaining a double consciousness the world is just never the same when you're constantly thinking about how race and power and privilege and class are at play at all times. You know, it was kind of like if I was a white dude in the 1600s named John Locke, I became enlightened, if you will. And these parallels between wokeness and the enlightenment are kind of uncanny. Romano writes, the enlightenment was meant to be an era of new progressive ideas and folks fancied themselves awakened by new ideas and knowledge. Similarly, people today who identify as woke also see themselves as having been awakened to a new set of ideas, value systems, and knowledge. The mode and the values are different, but the sensibility, the idea that previously you were blind and now you can see, is the same. So yeah, it was kind of just like putting on a pair of sunglasses, or actually taking off. <laughs> More like taking off um, glasses and just seeing the world in a completely different light. And I remember always, you know, kind of talking about this stuff with my parents and like just always like bringing up, you know, whatever social inequities or, you know, race issues were going on at the time. And they honestly got annoyed with me. They were like, why do you always talk about this? Like, stop being so depressing. <laughs> And I'm like, this is not depressing. This is just the real world. Um, but, you know, they got kind of annoyed with me because they're basically like, you know, we've been new. Racism existed. Like, you're not the first person to discover this. Until Trump's election, I don't think I was very vocally woke outside of my, like, home because it didn't seem to be a mainstream thing, as in something white people were engaging in. But I think that, you know, that was a turning point. Just having, like, this very overtly, like, sexist and racist and xenophobic president in office I, it rallied a lot of different people around a common enemy like for a while i was just used to like normal quiet racism but the things he said were just so out of pocket that you know people weren't really afraid to like retaliate back equally as harshly there was a huge surge in feminists against Trump and his contemporaries with phrases like nasty woman. Such a nasty trust, woman. And nevertheless, she persisted. Nevertheless, she persisted. And these slogans like Black Lives Matter or Stay Woke, they weren't just words you wore on a button or a t-shirt or wrote on a poster for a rally because the most prevalent and efficient vehicle for self-expression wasn't what we wore or where we went, it was our online presence. And for some Gen Zers like myself, our online presence became the thing that precedes us. Like our social media profiles, you know, they were, they are our reputations. At least at the time, I definitely thought that a social media profile, a few pixels, was a thorough and accurate representation of a whole sentient being, which I don't necessarily believe that today anymore. So naturally, because social media was so ubiquitous, um, it was like just naturally the place where we put our thoughts and opinions on social justice matters. I mean, for me, I feel like it was mostly 
Twitter, at least before June 2020. I mean, I just like never used Facebook, so I don't really know what happens there. Um, <laughs> oh, not great things. Mostly it was Twitter for me. Um, and before June 2020, I feel like Instagram, or at least my corner, of Instagram was largely apolitical. And like I said before, the word woke was definitely expiring before June 2020, but I feel like after that summer, it turned sour. Last summer on Instagram, we saw a huge influx of wokeness, and I'm not even saying this in like a passionizing way. Um, just quite simply, we saw a lot of people at first acknowledging and becoming aware of injustice in society. Um, and you know, the death of George Floyd was kind of the inciting incident. People were posting black squares and posting and reposting and creating aesthetically pleasing Instagram infographics on systemic racism, which I talked about in my Instagram infographic industrial complex video, if you want to watch that. And along with all this came this wave of people calling out corporations and brands and celebrities and influencers to you know, also acknowledge injustice and do something about it if they have the resources. And I want to clarify that this is different from like holding people accountable for like doing something bad, but I thought it was really interesting how people were now starting to be like, hey, you haven't said anything, like you need to say something about this. Um, and this ties into what I'm going to talk about next, even though it seems a little bit unrelated. I'm going to talk about Bo Burnham's special, Inside. So if you're anything like me, you recently watched Bo Burnham's special on Netflix, Inside, and you absolutely loved it, and you can't get that song about FaceTiming your mom out of your head. Inside kind of synthesizes many of Bo Burnham's qualms with the internet into a one and a half hour, really entertaining, comedy special that honestly just feels like a really long and really well-made YouTube video. He had a really great line in the song Welcome to the Internet that goes, apathy's a tragedy and boredom's a crime. Apathy's a tragedy and boredom is a crime. But I mostly want to talk about the first half of the line, apathy's a tragedy and how it relates to wokeness on the internet. I feel like apathy, especially in a very politically polarized place such as America right now, like, to be apathetic is one of the worst things that you can be. There was this quote by Desmond Tutu that really kind of resurged in the past year, in 2020. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And I think this is true, but I think a lot of people began to equate not publicly posting your opinion on an injustice to apathy. And if apathetic is the worst thing that you can be, I feel like you just get a bunch of people performatively posting things so that they're not perceived as apathetic. They don't actually care. They just don't want to be apathetic because that's the worst thing that you can be in a place where you have to choose a side. A side note on like apathy, but I have always usually thought of apathy in the context of like caring about art, if that makes sense. Um, I'm a film major. So for me, I always kind of associated the worst thing to be apathetic about is like, if I put out a film out there or like a piece of art and like people didn't care, like that's worse than like people hating it. Like apathy is nothing. They don't care about it. Like it would be better if people hated it. At least there was like passion behind it. At least there was something behind it. But like apathy is like the worst possible reaction that you can get, I think, in terms of art. Um, but I think when it comes to like injustices in society, I think apathy is bad. But I do think it's a mistake to equate apathy to simply not publicly expressing your opinion on any and all things all the time. Like, is that necessary? I don't think so. I do think the line, apathy is a tragedy, um, does kind of encapsulate the way people were in droves asking people on social media with influence to like say or do something about injustices. I think a lot of this demand was based obviously asking, you know, politicians and billionaires to like, hey, maybe do something about like these wild injustices in society instead of just tweeting because you actually have like the money and power and resources to do something about it. I think that's based and probably necessary um, but then it got to the point where you know people were asking celebrities and then like influencers and then like 16 year old TikTok stars to put out 
their statement on you know race relations in the United States. Is it really necessary to hear a 16 year old white girl from Connecticut's opinions on like race relations in the US, you know? And then when a celebrity or an influencer doesn't say the right thing or they say something and it's like not that great, you know, then they'll get accused of being performative. But it's like, but we wanted them to say something in the first place. But now that they said something and it just like seems very low effort or like not groundbreaking, now it's, you know, performative. I think we have to be realistic with our expectations and ask, is it really necessary to hear everyone's opinion ever on anything all the time? And I'm really not trying to minimize terrible injustices in society. You know, I care about things. I'd just rather see support for these issues with appointed sort of people who truly care and are willing to educate themselves and take action beyond the internet rather than have a large but easily puncturable and ephemeral cloud of support that comes and goes as it pleases. It's like a wave of confectionery colored appeasement that tricks us into thinking that change is actually happening and that work is being done because Nike, for example, a multinational corporation made a woke ad. Like, we have to ask, what did that ad do besides make Nike a bunch of money? You know, before we completely write off the word woke. I feel like woke didn't even get a chance to like, do much before it got cancelled. It's unfortunate that the word has become so oversaturated and diluted that people are tired of it when I don't even think it really got a chance to do anything. And I think that's just kind of the play of like modern internet activism that it's set up in a web and a network and it's not really set up like a pyramid where there's one leader who can, you know, organize people and take action, which was one of the really great strengths of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, but also a weakness because they just killed the leaders. So it's kind of a catch-22. Those are like my anthropological thoughts on wokeness. Is that even a word? I don't know. But I quickly want to shift and talk about wokeness from a psychological perspective and the psychological burden of being woke. I do think that constantly thinking about injustice and oppression can kind of be like having a dark cloud hanging over your head at all times. And I don't think that it's ever really been an option to even be aware of so many plights in the world until the internet where you could just like know everything happening at all times and also like in this era of like a lot of honestly performative activism where people expect some people expect everyone to be aware of and to be caring about every single thing wrong in the world at all times and i think just like mentally that is not a um viable sustainable thing to do at all times i don't think we're supposed to know what all people are feeling and thinking and doing all the time like in just a normal social media context let alone of knowing like every injustice in the world and being expected to like be fully empathetic to every single thing going wrong at all times even if it has nothing to do with you i think obviously empathy is important but i think there is a point where it's like it's just not realistic to be constantly on like that and I thought this concept of like the psychological burden of wokeness was interesting because I saw this video on YouTube of this girl. Um, she posted, this is how I escaped the cult of wokeness. And I watched it and I feel like it was an interesting video. I still feel like it's important even though woke has kind of lost its edge that like the rejection of wokeness isn't an excuse to like be an asshole and to like be racist and to like you know, not use people's proper pronouns and stuff. I think the opposite of wokeness because of how hollow wokeness has become, because how much it's really lost its true meaning, is just actually caring and like being a decent person. It's not like being terrible and that's the solution to like not being woke. It's just, it's not an excuse to be insensitive. The last point I'll make though is I think the issue of wokeness as a psychological burden, I feel like there's kind of two different perspectives to have. I think some people would view it as an oppression, and those are kind of the people who have really um, poisoned the term woke. But I think there are people who have like learned a lot from this movement and learned a lot from like seeing injustice in society. And from that perspective, it's an enlightenment. 
and I think there's like a fine line between being aware of these things but also just not making it your whole life like even if it is your life's work to be like working in DEI or something um, I think there's a fine line between being aware but not necessarily letting that awareness like suffocate you anyway i have to go to a meeting this video is going to end here um i hope that you guys enjoyed it even though i'm kind of struggling to remember what the point of it was it's just my thoughts on wokeness and i'll see you guys in my next video bye